So let's read it. Leviticus 1, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And it says here, The Lord called to Moses from the tabernacle and said to him, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you present an animal as an offering to the Lord, you may take it from your herd of cattle or your flock of sheep and goats. Now, we'll look at that in just a second. But today, the phrase I want to look at is, when you present an animal as an offering to the Lord, you may take it from your herd or from your flock of sheep and goats. Uh, That's really the phrase we're going to camp out in. But after this, we get seven chapters of detailed instructions about how to offer sacrifices, how to uh, make those sacrifices there at the temple. The five offerings uh, are covered each in its own chapter. So chapter one for the first one, chapter two, chapter three for the third, chapter four, and then chapter five for the fifth. It just works that way. And then six and seven are a bit of a summary and review for the the priests who are going to be operating these sacrifices, who are actually going to be taking them and performing the sacrifices. So six and seven are a bit of a summary and recap for the priests. So these each get their own chapter. And part of what makes Leviticus so difficult to read, part of why we stop after chapter three or four or seven is because it is a bit repetitive, is it not? So as you read, it's, you know, if you're taking a, 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 an animal from the herd, then you'll need to take its body... You'll cut it this way, you'll take its limbs and do it this way, and you'll take the kidneys and you'll put them this way, and you'll take the fat and you'll keep it this way, and then you'll burn it this way. And then if it's a sheep, you'll do the very same thing. It's almost word for word the same thing. It just keeps repeating itself. So you get each of the sacrifices in five chapters, then six and seven are a bit of a repeat of those first five chapters. And so by the time you're in six and seven, you're thinking, this is the same thing. Why is he saying the same thing over and over again? And uh, after a while, it just becomes difficult to really track um, or understand why it's like that. So real quickly, just to sort of alleviate some of that angst for us, when you think about um, the fact that, that, that repetition is a part of Leviticus, uh, you, you need to, I guess maybe it would help, and you might need to think about it this way, that, that it would have been critical in an oral tradition of passing on the Word of God. They didn't have the printing press like we have today, and so they, not every priest had his own manual, so to speak. So in order to teach someone, and really in order for someone to remember on the job, on the spot, in the moment, um, rep- repetition was actually cru- crucial critical for them. Um, Without the printing press, in other words, it made it easier to teach to the next priest or to a new priest. Uh, It made it easier for that priest to remember on the job. It made it harder to forget, harder to mess up if in your mind there was a running refrain that repeated itself over and over again. And so all the repetition in the book of Leviticus may seem a bore to you and I, but to a priest back in the times of Leviticus, he would have been grateful for it. He would have been glad that in his mind he can remember the patterns and, and remember the, that there was uh, the, the passing down of this ritual and the repetition having something to do with memorizing it, even internalizing it. And so the way I think about it, uh, the way, it's kind of like a refrain in a well-known song or something like that. The repetition in Leviticus is a bit like that. It's a bit like the refrain. Uh, you know, it's, it's the song you don't know the words to the verses, but you do know the refrain, right? It's kind of like that in the book of Leviticus. And for these priests and Levites, as they're performing, they would have been going through the motions, but they would have been doing it in a pattern, in a cadence, in an order, in a ritual that for them was familiar um, and less likely for them to have, to have forgotten. In fact, it's almost like getting into a groove of sorts so that these priests were able to do the functions that they were required to do, but have a bit of a groove to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I don't want to be sacrilegious there. So they weren't grooving, okay, but they, they did have a bit of a, a refrain, a chorus running in their minds that really drew them into the experience of the moment. And so um, for them, anyway, it was a very formative practice. It really shaped the way they think and shaped the way they operated because they couldn't forget it, I think, if they tried. Uh, 
Back to Leviticus, though. Um, let's get back to that. Um, Leviticus 1, uh, verse 2, it says, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Remember, we're just in verse 1 and verse 2 of chapter 1. We are just at the beginning. And, and the reason we spent the last couple of weeks giving an introduction is because here in the book of Leviticus, in the first chapter, we get very little introduction. We really get no introduction, maybe. It's a better way to put it. We just jump right in. And <clears throat> when we jump right in, we jump right into this. Give the instructions. When you present an animal as an offering to the Lord, you must take it, or you may take it from your herd of cattle or your flock of sheep and goes. Right away, we begin with an instruction about offerings. And so you just, right off the bat, that's where we start. Um... So as I think about it, that word offering there is the word korban or korban, and uh, it means gift. In the New Testament, it had come to mean gift, and really it means, uh, in Hebrew, it also has the, uh, the meaning to come near. So it means to come near and to offer a gift, to bring your gift near uh, would be another way to put it, bring your gift near. But if anyone wants to offer a gift and come near, uh, this is how they can do that. Now, I just, I want you to think about that for a second. The opening line in the book of Leviticus is, if anyone wants to come near to me, here's how we do that. Is that amazing when you think about it? Now, you'll have to think about that some more on your own. But I do want to try to dig into that just a little bit. This God is not distant. He's not detached. This God, of all the gods that people were worshiping back then and still worship today, this God has given us access to him and we can have a relationship with him, which I think at that point might have been relatively new ideas. I mean, really in, world, in terms of world religions, it might still be a, a relatively unique idea that this God, this particular God, has the desire to be in personal relationship with his people. And so the opening line here for Leviticus isn't, you have to do this and you must do that. We get to some of that, and there's a reason for that. Remember, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. There's, there's a real need for their lives to be reformed uh, a, away from the pattern that they learned in Egypt and into the new pattern of life in freedom with God and what it looks like to be free. So they do need instruction, but it doesn't really start that way. It does start for the priests um, to make sacrifices, and there are some instructions there but the opening line is now that we're here now that we're free now that I've delivered you from Egypt if anyone wants to come near and say thanks with an offering if anyone wants to express gratitude if anyone wants to eat with me if anyone wants to fellowship with me if anyone among the people find in themselves an overwhelming sense of joy then let's get together tell them here's how they can come and here's how we can be together that's beautiful, guys. It's brilliant. So as we look at it, <clears throat> the five offerings are, are something we want to today do a little bit of an overview of. And, and so the first three offerings really are voluntary offerings. They are offerings that would express gratitude, offerings that would say thank you, and offering that would say I love you. These are offerings, uh, voluntary offerings that would be offerings of thanksgiving and peace. Uh, the first three are voluntary. Again, they're not required to give these offerings. These would be offerings that you would give of your own free will because you were either overwhelmed with gratitude or because you were grateful that some relationship had been restored or, uh, or some realization had occurred and you wanted to give an offering. If anyone wants to give an offering. It's, it's funny that even with these sacrifices, the first three are for saying thank you, I love you, and the last two are for saying I'm sorry or for making restitution, for making things right. And, and the imbalance there is intriguing to me. I don't have much to say about that other than it is striking that the, there's three for saying thanks and I love you. And there's really two for saying, hey, I want to make things right and I'm sorry. He's just more interested in various ways of saying thank you than he is all the various ways he would like for us to grovel uh, in saying I'm sorry. Do you see that? But nonetheless, he does make a way for us to say sorry. This is another relatively new idea. This God is actually saying, look, I realize your frame. I realize that you'll make mistakes. I'm not going to hold that over your head. If you want to get it right and to make it right, if you would like to pursue a relationship with me after betraying my trust, here's the way we can continue to fellowship. 
In other words, these are wonderful in the eyes of the one who's making this sacrifice. This is something you would do with a deep sense of appreciation. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for what happened with my children and saving their lives. Thank you for what happened with salvation. Thank you for on and on and on, all the sacrifices we can make. And then when we make a mistake, this is a God who understands. He understands and has made a way. And thankfully, he is willing to... To, to, uh, to restore that relationship, to bring us back into fellowship. He's not holding it against us. He's not stiff-arming us. He's actually saying, you can come near, and we can make this right. Guys, that's incredible. It really is. And, and as I think about it more, you know, the, the book of Leviticus does contain law and order. It does contain uh, judgment, even, and, and condemnation. But it, it begins with inviting the people to come near for these voluntary uh, offerings of gratitude. Here's how you can come near to God. Here's how you can express your joy and gratitude. And so they're learning a new way of relating to God and then a new way of relating to others. You know, and in the sacrifices, we're not only learning a new way of relating to God and others, but we're also learning a way of expressing joy and expressing gratitude. I think then in the fourth and fifth commands, those are when, again, when you've wronged someone, when you want to make it right with God or you want to make it right with someone else, then you would offer those fourth and fifth sacrifices. We're going to get to look at those again in just a second, but a, a, a little more commentary. These people are leaving slavery and Egypt. Do you remember that? They've been there for 400 years, and, and not only are they as broken as we are, but they've had 400 years of training and cultural formation there in Egypt. It's all they know, <coughs> excuse me, and it's all they've known for the last 10 generations. In many ways, uh, Leviticus really is about unlearning the ways of Egypt. It's about creating new formative practices. It's about creating new rituals of, uh, of obedience and gratitude to God. It's showing them a new way to live here in this newfound freedom they've got. So my point is here, as I think about it, they're, they're trained in Egypt, they're coming out, and they need to learn a new way. But in the meantime, of course they're going to make mistakes. Of course they're going to sin against God. Of course they're going to sin against each other. And so my point as I think about it is that we would obviously you know, do wrong to each other and, and, and even often forget to be intentional or considerate. Do you guys remember that from last week? That was sort of the, the main thrust and the punchline of the message. One of the punchlines last week's message was that God desires for us to order our lives around his presence and to be intentional in that and to be considerate towards him in our day-to-day -day actions and decisions. And so as I think about it, this is, a, this is a furthering of that intentionality and consideration God wants for us. I mean, how often do you and I have the, sen the, the sense that maybe we've sinned or maybe we've made a mistake? How often do we have the sense that we've hurt someone? I mean, how about this? How many times have you wished you hadn't said something or hadn't said it or hadn't said it that way or wished you hadn't done something <clears throat> or wondered if maybe you'd uh, wished for a better time, wished the timing was better? Anyway, I think, as I think about that, these people would have been in the same condition. And, and the real blessing here is, is that God doesn't just leave us there to sort it out on our own. He makes a way of restitution. He provides a way of reconciliation. He shows us here in Leviticus, as it opens, he shows us who he really is. He shows us what kind of being he is at his core and what kind of relationship he wants to have with us by making a way to come near to him, by making a way to make things right with him, by beginning the process of showing us what it looks like to flourish under his care and in relationship with others. So, I think as we look at these, that's kind of how I want you to see it. We're going to read a few sections. I'll mention the five sacrifices, and then I'll just read the first verse or two. It is a bit repetitive, and, and we don't need to get into all of those details, although we could make meaning out of about every line. I'm just going to go through the five offerings quickly here. The first is the burnt offering, and that really word, the word there for burnt offering really means uh, that which goes up. And so uh, this burnt offering was just totally consumed. It would stay on the fire until it was totally consumed consumed and, and turned into ashes. Leviticus 1 verses, 9 to, uh, verses 3 to 9 says, If the animal you present as a burnt offering is from the herd, it must be a male with no defects. Bring it to the entrance of the tabernacle so that you may be accepted by the Lord. Lay your hand on the animal's head and the Lord will accept its death in your place to purify you. Do you see that substitution there? 
<clears throat> death in your place to purify you, making you right with him. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then slaughter the young bull in the Lord's presence, and Aaron's sons, the priests, will present the animal's blood by splattering it against the sides of the altar that stands at the entrance to the tabernacle. Then skin the animal and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priest, will build a wood fire on the altar. They will arrange the pieces of the offering, including the head and the fat, on the wood burning on the altar. But then the internal organs in the legs must first be washed clean with water. Then the priest will burn the entire sacrifice on the altar as a burnt offering. It is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And the very next verse says the very same thing about what to do with a sheep. <laughs> and then the next section is what to do with a sheep and goat. And then the next section is what to do with uh, a bird. And it really is very similar, just repeats itself about how to go about this. Now, I think there's three categories here in the first chapter for the burnt offering. And so those would be, I guess, a way of indicating what resources you have. I mean, it's interesting to me that within, within months of leaving slavery, everyone on the same playing field, there's already a disparity in, in wealth and, and uh, possessions. Um, I think this is just the human way. Nothing really to... Uh, say about that other than it's just interesting that you know I guess they're imagining within a year or two or three some will have more and more to give and others will have less but can give less but I think for me the real key here is that God creates a way for everyone to come and to worship and to bring an offering. And it really isn't dependent on whether you can afford it or not. He's creating pathways for everyone depending on um, sort of, you know, what resources they have. So verse three is if you have more than you give from your herd or your cattle, if you, if you uh, have this much, then, you know, if, you, if what you're able to do is uh, from the flock, then you offer a sheep or goat. And then in verse 14, uh, if what you have uh, only allows you to bring a bird and just about anyone should be able to do that. And so this is what you can do to give a bird. Access to this God is given from the highest ranks to the lowest ranks. Do you see that? So we're upending a way of understanding how the world works in Egypt um, in terms of power structures and realizing that this God, although he doesn't seem to eliminate, at least not here in the passage, you know, the differences... Um, in sort of status or possessions or resources. What he does do, though, is make access for everyone right where they are. And to me, I think it's just a really interesting thing. Everyone can give something. And then he says it's a pleasing aroma to God. If you're reading through the book of Leviticus, this is a bit of a refrain that you would find throughout the book of Leviticus. They offer this sacrifice, and it's a pleasing aroma to God. He finds it pleasing. He enjoys it. He, he's grateful as, grateful as you are for making the sacrifice. And there's something uh, really beautiful that's happening there. And I think what this tells us as we think about it is that this is not an angry God at his core. Does God have anger? Does God express wrath? Will he carry out judgment? Yes. But is that who he is at his core? No. When we get to the scriptures, there's a big difference in the New Testament between saying God is love and God executes wrath. Big difference. He is one. He can do the other. When I am, you know, on, on my deathbed or, or something like that, and my kids are all telling stories and we're all laughing, do you know what I don't want them to remember? My discipline. Those aren't the stories I want them to tell. They're not the ones I want them to relish in. I want them to remember the love I had. I want them to remember that, yes, I did. I do remember having to send you to your room. I do remember I was good cop and I tried to listen to you and I tried to reason with you and then I was bad cop and I was a bad dad for that moment. Uh, maybe not. But I do remember all the various ways I tried my best to whip you into shape. Literally, sometimes. <laughs> all the ways I tried to really get your attention, tried to endear your heart to me. Yes, I was a disciplinarian. But I, I, I loved you in that, and I did it because I loved you, and I wanted to win your heart to me, and I wanted you to see who I really was. And I also want you to be a productive <laughs> citizen of society someday. Goodness. Um, so there's all of that embedded in there. There's all of that embedded in there. But I guess what I'm saying is I want them to see that kind of the way that God does is that, no, I, I, I am love. And embedded in my love is the action of discipline. And I will carry out condemnation and judgment. But we, like rebellious children do, just see him as a disciplinarian. We think that he's eager to do it. 
We totally miss that I'm eager to rebel. We think that he um, is, is sort of uh, characterized in our minds as the one who is angry all the time, uh, the one who is constantly inconvenienced by us. And so I think what needs to change is, is to see that, that the same way I would want my kids to see me is that, yes, God does execute discipline, judgment. Yes, there will be condemnation, condemnation. Yes, we will stand before God. And there will be people who live forever with him. And there will be people who do not live forever with him. And, and yet, I think our twisted hearts would say maybe he's evil um, because of that. Or maybe he doesn't really love. And I think what we need to see is no, it's not like that at all. At the beginning of the book of Leviticus, we see that this is a God who is not angry. Uh, he is angry with sin, but toward us, his disposition sort of at its core is one to welcome us into his presence. If anyone wants to come near, this is how you do it. Do you see that? You kind of have to see that. You're not going to get very far in your attempts at obedience if you don't see that ultimately this is a good God who does love me. And when he asks me to do something, it's because he loves me. When he asks me to stop doing something, it's because he loves me. Otherwise, our hearts are twisted and we're always misunderstanding our parents. We're always misunderstanding authority figures and frankly, always misunderstanding God until we begin to see that it's rooted his, his love and his desire for us is rooted in uh, his, his desire to be present with us. So I think what that means to me is if then uh, this is who he is, then what we get at the, at the beginning of the book of Leviticus is that this is a God who has, he's not like the other gods, the unseen and unknown gods where we don't know where we stand with him. This is a God who is saying, you know where you stand with me, I saved you. You know where you stand with me, I forgave you. You know where we stand, I'm making a way for you to come near. So you know how I feel about you. Balls in our court, so to speak. Because he's already expressed, here's where we stand with each other. You see, there's no anxiety about where I stand with God or how he feels about me when we really understand all that he's done. And I think this would have been significant for the children of Israel and hugely significant for all of us. We need to learn what he was trying to form in their hearts. Well, that was just the first offering and I promised that we would just do an overview the grain offering is about grain instead of animals. Was, was Abel wrong uh, for offering, I mean, right for offering an animal and Cain wrong for offering grain? Well, not really, not necessarily. I mean, you're supposed to offer the, the first of your grains and crops. And, and even here, <clears throat> the second offering is a way of saying thank you. It's a way of offering grain instead of animal. I think the real issue with Cain and Abel was a heart issue, a disposition towards God in making the sacrifice, which we can talk about more in a little bit if we can get to that point. But in Leviticus 2, verses 1 to 2, it says, when you present a grain as an offering, or present grain as an offering to the Lord, the offering must consist of choice flour. Let me stop right there. In, in, in the uh, ESV and others, it says the finest flour. And here it says the choice, uh, consists of choice flour. And so for me, um, you know, I think of, uh, <laughs> oh man, I don't want to offend anybody. I was going to say the difference between Harris Teeter and, and then, but I think I'm not going to go there. <clears throat> Uh, Whole Foods and, and, and whatever else, okay? Uh, I'm only kidding. But I, that's kind of how we think, you know, as Americans. Like when it says finest flour, we're thinking like, ah, the good stuff, you know, that you'd find from like a, a, a you know, some kind of, okay, I'm going to just quit. So I think what he's saying here and, and what I think the Hebrew bears out is actually it would be the, the um, it's choice and it's uh, the finest, sure, but because it is the finest ground, the most finely ground uh, flour. There's another grain, another grain offering, one that is a way of saying thanks um, and making peace with God, and it's coarsely ground, and this is more finely ground. And when you make an offering to God, I just want you to think about the intentionality and the consideration it would take to make this offering as a way of saying thanks. It takes a little bit of work. 
It takes a little bit of forethought. You're not just gonna get some grain, smash it up, whip it together, and then just kind of give it to God as an afterthought or as a way of saying like, oh, honey, did you grab the offering? Oh, let me whip something up real, real quickly. It doesn't work that way. It takes time. This is finely ground. This would have been intentional. You would have been grinding it for a little bit longer than you would normally do. And as you did that, your mind would have been thinking, you know, this is for the Lord. This is an act of worship. This is a service to the Lord. I hope that he's pleased. I believe he's going to find this to be a pleasing aroma when we add it to the burnt offering. There's just, there's real intentionality there. There's real consideration I wasn't going to do this, but one of the kids in um, church today, just before we preached, came up and brought me this little note. It says, I uh, Pastor Chris, I love you. It's got two cats and a dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's got stars and hearts on it. I mean, it takes a little bit of time to put something like that together. It takes a little bit of thought. Don't you see? That's all the Lord wants. Just a little bit of thought. Just a little bit of intentionality. Just take a little bit longer to, to grind it a little more finely. Just to have something to offer that really means something to you, not just because you think it means something to him. You know? It's like bringing flowers home and just kind of tossing them on the table. No, you like those. It doesn't work that way. It's like saying, Lord, I know you love this. And uh, frankly, I'm beginning to love this. I'm beginning to love thinking about you. I'm beginning to love what it looks like to think about how you've called me to come near. I'm beginning to feel some gratitude when I think about the opportunity to engage in a ritual that means something to you and is beginning to mean something to me. Do you see what's happening in the book of Leviticus? There's a beautiful formation of their lives and hearts around gratitude to God. Even in the sin offerings, which we haven't gotten to. Just grateful that there's a way to make this right so I don't have to wallow in my own sorrow night after night and in all of my deep regret. Thank you, God, that there's a way out of this. Don't you see that? This is so good when you study it. This is the book of Leviticus. The grain offering. <clears throat> it's just a way of showing gratitude. I can't get into the detail. We talked about the finest flour. There's the oil that is costly. It costs you something. Uh, I mean, that's uh, one commentary said that um, that's kind of, I thought it was great to talk about re-gifting. But that's why we're embarrassed for anyone to find out that we had re-gifted it, right? Because sometimes when we re-gift something, um, is it really about the value of that thing? I mean, what if I get, a, uh, I don't know, I'm, let me, ah, my mind's drawing a blank, but let's say I, I get a crock pot for Christmas, a really nice one, a really nice crock pot. And then I go to your birthday party and bring you this $400 crock pot. I don't even know if that's nice. I'm sorry, that's embarrassing. <laughs> but I bring you this really valuable crock pot. Does it make it any less valuable that I had regifted it? Or is the real issue that makes it less value the fact that it really didn't cost me anything? So the value of what we bring isn't really, it's, it's kind of separate and it's not really the same thing as the cost it was to us in bringing it. And so when I think about it too, that's what we're talking about here. A sacrifice and an offering that costs us some time, might even cost us some money, might cost us some energy, and this, I think, for us is the real value of these kinds of offerings. Really, it's both the value and the cost that makes a sacrifice or an offering meaningful. And then there's the incense that comes with that grain offering, which had to be crushed. You know, incense has to be burned. <laughs> I guess the kind we know about today, anyway. The, the incense has to be burned. And, and then also this kind of incense would have to be crushed. It would have to be kind of pressed um, and crushed and then laid on, mixed in and then laid on the altar and you would begin to smell it. So it has to kind of go through that, that burning and crushing and pressing uh, act. And I think you would have sort of acknowledged uh, something in that motion too, that not only did this cost me something, but that to really get the most out of something in life, sometimes you have to be pressed 
And sometimes this is an offering to the Lord when we go through something like that. And then seasoned with salt, the Bible says that it, um, in there it says that it was seasoned with salt as a reminder of the everlasting covenant, the preservation uh, that salt does. Um, so anyway, there's just so much there, guys, that we couldn't possibly dig in uh, unless we did turn this into a 20-week uh, series. So and maybe we will, who knows? <clears throat> but I think for me, I, the, 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 the real punch, uh, punchline there and the real catch is that this would have been something that took you time to prepare. It's a gift that had intentionality and required consideration as you prepared it. The third is a fellowship offering. The, the, the fellowship offering is a, a meal that you eat together. And it, when, in the Hebrew, it's a sh- sort of like shelomim or something like that. Um, so it's shelomim, which kind of is... Um, um, reminiscent, it has the sound and even, even same root as shalom and the word peace. And so this third offering as a voluntary offering as a way of expressing peace and enjoying the peace that we have with God. So they would come and bring this and they would eat together. And in a way, it was a show that there was peace in our relationship uh, with each other. And that's from Leviticus 3 verses 1 to 5. If you present an animal from the herd as a peace offering, the third kind of offering, a third way of showing gratitude and expressing joy. He says, um, then it may be a male or a female, but it must have no defects. Uh, You can't just bring anything. You can't just find one, and you can't just bring the one that's lame and was going to die anyways. Do you see? There's value and intentionality and consideration here in that too. But anyway, it must have no defects. Lay your hand on the animal's head, slaughter it at the entrance of the tabernacle. Then Aaron's sons, the priests, will splatter its blood against the sides of the altar. And the priest must present part of this peace offering as a special gift to the Lord. And this includes all the fat around the internal organs, the two kidneys. And someone just yawned. Hey, cut that out. We're studying the book of Leviticus here. I love this book. We're going to study this book. This is a good book. This, these are good things to be reading. And there's something here for us as we study it. Let me start again. <laughs> no, I'm not going to start from the top. <laughs> Although it does repeat itself. <clears throat> the priest must present part of this peace offering as a special gift to the Lord. And this, of course, includes the fat around the internal organs, the two kidneys, the fat around them near the loins, and the long lobe of the liver. Didn't know you know, we had one of those. This must be removed with the kidneys and Aaron's sons will burn them on top of the burnt offering. So we're going to burn the burnt offering and then we're going to put this on top of that offering and burn it all together. Do you see that? It's a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And this was the idea behind these um, sacrifices, particularly the fellowship offering, is that this was to reaffirm or even to repair a relationship. To eat together would have been a display of hospitality, a demonstration of peace between us. If I invite you over to eat with me, it's to show that there's peace between us. If the Lord invites us to come near and to share in an offering where we eat together, this is a show of peace in our relationship with him. It would have been a huge blessing. You would have, you would kind of, looked around you to see if any of this was real because it would have just been overwhelming and it would have been uh, good news for you. And I think in ancient foreign cultures, I mean, that's really a, a show of hospitality was to share a meal together. And whether you may not realize this, but in the scriptures, when you start all the way back uh, in Genesis and you work all the way to Revelation, there's a theology of meals. And I don't have time to really develop a theology of meals. But what I mean when I say that is that there's actually um, meals throughout the Bible that are critical points of relationship with mankind. That There's um, an understanding that meals are an integral part of what it means to be human, what it means to be in relationship with someone. And so this uh, has, has some real um, power to it when you read and understand that, that when someone welcomes you into their presence and invites you to eat at their table, as God has done with his people, it communicates acceptance. It begins the process of the removal of your shame. But not just the removal of guilt for the sin you've committed, but when you come here in fellowship with God, there's a removal of the sense that you shouldn't be in his presence, the sense that you don't deserve to be participating with others in an act like this. You see, there's an undoing of what's happening in our hearts when we go through the process here. The fellowship offering really is a humble response on the part of the people where they can be grateful to know and be known, grateful to love and be loved by God. And that's the, the fellowship offering. It's a celebration of peace. It's, it's the recognition that we are eating a meal with the divine. And, and all of the covenants, you share a meal, 
Um, with, with our weekly communion, it's a part of a meal that we do. Uh, Jesus even says, I will not eat with you here until I eat with you again in the new uh, kingdom. Jesus is sort of uh, stoking their imagination about eating together someday again. And then even in the, the book of Revelation, there's the idea that we will eat again with God. We will fellowship with him. And, and I think th these are all a, a present reality for us through Christ. But I think it's really interesting to just see the, the meals all throughout the Bible. So those are the first three free will offerings. And they are of thanksgiving voluntary offerings to God. They were offerings that I think in that day would have been a bit radical, a bit powerful in their enactment. And then the last two offerings are for our sins. The uh, sin offering uh, is the, the hatat is for when you realize that you've wronged someone or you've violated something. So let's look at, at these uh, real quickly. The, the verse here would be, <clears throat> the first one is in Leviticus 4, 1 and 3. I just want you to see, it's when the high priest does something wrong. It's when the entire congregation as a community does something wrong. And then it's when any leader in the community does something wrong. And then it's when any member of the community does something wrong. You see, he basically covers all the bases. But there's one in there that we're maybe least familiar with, and that is some sense of communal sin. Like we as a nation have done something wrong, right? You know, we reject that notion, I think. But here in the scriptures, we have to embrace that notion. We may not embrace the exact pattern of how to make things right, um, but I do think we have to acknowledge that when God looks at a nation, he looks at its leaders, he looks at its community as a whole and the way they've treated other people groups and other nations, and he looks at its individuals. It's, it's both individuals and communities, whole communities. So anyway, do what you want with that. I think there's a lot we could do with that, <clears throat> but I, I want you to see that the principle for that is actually found here in Leviticus 4, 1 to 3, and so on. Uh, and in Leviticus 4, 1 to 3, I'm just going to read the, the first verse. The, the Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. This is how you're to deal with those who sin unintentionally by doing anything that violates the Lord's commands. And then verse 3, if the high priest sins, this is what you do. Leviticus um, chapter 4, verses 13. If the entire Israelite community sins by violating one of the Lord's commands, and if the people don't realize it, they are still guilty. An entire community guilty. When they become aware of their sin, the people must bring a young bull as an offering for their sin and present it before the tabernacle. When they become aware of their sins, their collective sins, what they have done as a community, this I think is something maybe more familiar for ancient cultures and maybe even uh, Middle Eastern or South American cultures. Uh, there's just a real sense for uh, not just a personal offense, but an offense to my family. It's you've offended my family. You've you've offended our tribe. You've um, this is something that our family has done, or this is something that our tribe is guilty of. Something like that would maybe be um, something you might understand if you were in a different time or a different place. But I do think that back then he's speaking to something that might have some application for us today. Uh, what do you do when the entire community has wronged someone or some other segment of that community? Do we have a paradigm for that? Uh, you know, if we don't, then <clears throat> we really don't know how to say a value the diversity there, and we really don't know how to say sorry, do we? We just know best we can, we ought to probably stick to our guns and stand our ground. This is not a healthy way. It's actually the downfall of any nation to do that. Now, I don't think that it's the responsibility of the people of America to do this. I think it's the responsibility of the church in America to be peacemakers, to find a way, as they would have done there and as the people of God, to make things right somehow. Anyway, more on that, I think. Uh, but I, I do think this is something that would be good at least to maybe pursue on our own in thinking and allow the scriptures to shape our minds and maybe even talk more about in community group settings and, and in other places. But the next is when a leader realizes uh, his guilt, he sins and realizes. That would be Leviticus 4, 22 to 23. And then when any member of the community sins unintentionally or does what is forbidden, that would be Leviticus 4, 27. 
And then in Leviticus 5, if you're taking notes, 5, 1 to 5 is just a series of other commands to people. <clears throat> These are all commands to people about ways that uh, we need to get things right. He, the, the first one is if anyone sees a sin or sees an ill and they don't speak up, they are as guilty as the ones who had committed the crime. Those who are silent in the face of injustice are equally as guilty as the ones committing that injustice. Do you not see that? We don't have to do everything it says in the book of Leviticus. We're not a theocracy. But I do think as a people of God, we have to sort of find ways to make this principle fit for us as we go about interacting with our community and showing them uh, the way of Christ, the way forward. If anyone touches something unclean, if anyone thoughtlessly takes an oath, if anyone isn't careful with their words or they're careless with their promises, then here's how you can make things right. Isn't that amazing? Now let me ask you this. How relevant is any of what I'm talking about today? And how many times have we just blown right through the first five chapters of Leviticus thinking it didn't make sense and it doesn't apply today? It does make sense. It does apply today. And I think we've got to sort of unpack this together as a church family and as a community to see what it would look like if, if, if we uh, had rituals. What would it look like if we had rituals that we had to go through? Or what would it look like if, if we as a community would express that we've made a mistake or that we've sinned or that we want to make it right? We and our world are paralyzed by the inability um, to say thank you and to say I'm sorry. And the, this is the way God creates. First and foremost, before we get to anything else in the law or in the book of Leviticus is, here's how you come near. Here's how you can say thank you, which tells you there should be something to be grateful for. And then here's how to say, I'm sorry, which tells you we should be looking to make things right. That's what peacemakers do. They make peace. They make things right. Do you see? And that's who we are as the people of God. Well, there's so much more to say about this, but I think that I'm out of time. So what we'll do then is we'll pick this back up in a couple of weeks and we'll make this a 12-week series. <laughs> I'm just, um, but I think we've got so much to unpack here, don't we? As we think about the, the sacrifices here and all of these offerings, what I, there is one thing I want you to see, and, and um, I want us to kind of talk about it a little bit more, but I do want you to see that this sacrificial system has been done away with. Uh, and we, we're no longer making these offerings and these sacrifices, but I want you to see why within just a couple of minutes, and then I want to celebrate why and how we can be grateful today for the sacrifice that God has made on, on our part. What I want you to see is that Jesus Christ has made a sacrifice for us in our place that is, uh, in a way, uh, in every way, really, a looking back to Leviticus and, and setting things right so that when Christ makes his offering, he is like the lamb of God that God offers as a sacrifice. Now, we just read some of those offerings and what it would look like to make that offering. And so when John the Baptist is baptizing people and then Jesus comes, he says, behold, the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Now for us, there's some romance there, right? If I was an artist, I would do a lamb, then I would draw a lion, then I would draw a dove, and all of that would just be pretty to me. But when John says, this is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, everyone kind of turns their heads and says, the sacrifice, the, there's just a little bit of a mixed understanding and, and, and uh, mixed emotion there as they think about that. But that's precisely what John means and precisely what Jesus intends to do, which is to offer himself as a, one of these five sacrifices, as really all of those five sacrifices, they all point to Christ and he offers himself in our place. So let me read that for you. Hebrews chapter nine, verse 11 and 12. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. <laughs> over all the good things that have come. Isn't that great? He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, 
which was not made by human hands and is not a part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered into the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. We're going to look at this again in a couple of weeks. But I want you to see Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. The old system under the law of Moses was really only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. In other words, they were a shadow of the good things. The good things are Christ and, and all that we have, all the limitless blessings and eternal life we have in Christ. But those are the good things to come. But he goes on to say the sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, day after day, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they would have been perfectly cleansed, then the sacrifices would have stopped because they would have been purified once for all time. And then their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. Those are, those are a little bit of a nod to what happens at the sacrifice of Christ. Look at that. He says, um, if, you, if, if, this, if there ever was a sacrifice that could remove all the sins for all time, then the worshipers would be pure forever. And the worshipers who accept that and offer that offering, um, would, their feelings of guilt would be uh, disappearing. That's the effect that the sacrifice of Christ has on us. But he says, as it were, though, verse 3, those sacrifices actually remind them of their sins year after year. It's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And in verse uh, 10, Hebrews 10, 10, for God's will was to make, uh, was to, uh, for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. That sacrifice does exist. The freedom uh, from our guilt can be disappearing. The notion that we are pure can be forming in our minds because of the sacrifice of Christ. And then Hebrews 10, 18. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. Christ has offered the once and for all sacrifice to end all offerings. And on that basis, there is no more need to make any more sacrifices. Do you see that? The system helped, but it was inadequate. The early impulse of fear and anxiety at what the gods think about us is resolved there in Leviticus, but it's only resolved inadequately, not in its fullest sense. And so here in Christ, in the sacrifice of Christ, his death for us, his burial, his resurrection, showing that his death was accepted by God as, as payment for our sin, this process uh, completely removes the need for any further sacrifice and completely removes the angst or anxiety as to what God thinks about us. Because of Christ, we can now come boldly into the throne room of God. Do you see the big difference there? And the great privilege we have in Christ? So then what of the five sacrifices in Leviticus? Well, remember, three were for saying what? Thank you. And two were for saying what? I'm sorry. Just a, a very flattened way of explaining that. I get that. But the principle of gratitude isn't removed at the, at the dawn of Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. In other words, we no longer have to say thank you. We did do away with all the sacrifices, but the sense of gratitude has been heightened because of Christ, or it should be heightened because of Christ. And I think it's the same for saying sorry. It's not as though we wouldn't say sorry. It's that we're even more grateful for than we were that we can say sorry, that we can come to him and embrace him and that he can embrace us because of what Christ has done. That there is a way to make things right and Christ has made that way. Christ has made that sacrifice. And, and one thing I was gonna say is that those sacrifices, if they weren't mixed with faith, they weren't accepted by God. You didn't just sort of throw a lamb at the priest and say, are we good? And then just kind of go on your way. You know, you would mix it with faith. There would be something there that says, Lord, this is intentional. Lord, I've been considerate. Lord, I consider this to be important in our relationship. And it's an expression of gratitude. And, and that's how sacrifices are made and applied to me and you. Christ has made the sacrifice and it needs to be mixed with our faith. We need to be saying, Lord, I have no offerings to bring, but I see Christ has made an offering and I accept that. Would you apply it to my account? Would you accept me, Lord, on the basis of what Jesus has done? I see now that that's the transaction and I receive it, Lord. Forgive me, accept me, 
can we share a meal together? Can I come back over and over and over again? Would you be faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness? And the answer is a resounding yes and always for all time because of Jesus. This is the best news. So Christ is all we need and the sacrifices we make now are just sacrifices of thanksgiving, sacrifices of praise, Romans 12, one and two. And so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. As an act of gratitude, let your bodies be a living and holy sacrifice. You see it? On the one hand, isn't it so wonderful that we've done nothing to earn this salvation, but that God has totally made the complete and total sacrifice and that we just come to him in gratitude. But on the other hand, it demands more than just a percentage of your income and an hour on Sunday. Because it was all by grace and because you owe everything to him, you're supposed to be grateful to give it all back. It's too little of a thing for a church to ask for your time and your money. When God beckons for our entire lives to be an offering and sacrifice of worship to him. And would you be glad to do it or not? And that depends on how you view God and whether there really is gratitude forming in you for all that he has done. So let's start there. Gratitude forming in us for all that he has done. Hebrews 13, 5, 15 and 16. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus, because of Jesus, a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share with people in need. These are sacrifices that please God. Well, more on that in two weeks. We won't be here next week. More on that in two weeks. But if I could get you to do anything for God, or if I could just convince you that he was worth it and move you from a place of entitlement to a place of gratitude, once you're in that space of gratitude, then anything he asks you to do, you'll do. You'll be glad to do it. And anything he asks you not to do anymore, you'll not do, and you'll have a growing sense of of great uh, gratitude and appreciation for him saving your life from that. Do you see? You'll start to obey with joy. That's what I want for us. So however God has spoken to you, respond in gratitude. Let's be filled with joy to do everything he tells us to do and to stop doing everything he tells us to stop doing. Let's obey. Let's repent. Let's turn from our own way and let's turn to his. Let's learn what it looks like to be free from bondage of our own way, bondage of Egypt, and free to live as free men and women under the care and authority and responsibility of our God who loves us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this.